thank Brother Art for another great Sunday school uh, lesson this morning. He does a wonderful job. I appreciate him. Hopefully, we're hoping to get Joel back in uh, 2022. <laughs> when his kids can drive their self to church, or maybe it'll be then. I don't know, but he's, uh, he's a little bit paranoid. Okay. But just let God just, you know, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Don't shake hands. Um, just, just do what we're doing, social distancing. And, and, uh, but don't spiritual distance. Okay? Don't spiritual distance. <laughs> and all this stuff. And I'm going to tell you, I said it before and I'll say it again. When this thing is over with, uh, and it's going to be over with November the 15th, <laughs> If, you know, I, I might get I might get it right one of these days. Then I'm 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 the guy, you know. Just keep guessing, and uh, maybe it'll happen. Who knows? But that's what I think. November the fifteenth at eleven a.m. It's going to be magically over with. But this is this is God knows exactly what He's doing. As aggravating as it is, uh, it's it's going to change us. It's going to help us, and uh, it's going to be a good thing. So, all righty. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. Again, thank you for being here today. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and uh, when they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son. Remember, the Bible says that David and Jonathan's heart were knit, they were friends. Uh, they admired the, each other's character, and they helped each other. And, uh, of course, uh, Jonathan was a son of Saul, and Saul made himself to be enemy of, uh, of David, and God eventually took him off the th throne. I'm going to preach a message on that one of these days, on God uh, putting you on a shelf. I don't think we've got a sense of that and a fear of that in, in our churches today, and I'm working on it. So... Uh, he said, and the king said, Is there not any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, son of Amiel from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, or grandson of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. David said unto him, Fear not. And you know how many times God says that in the New Testament when he's meeting with people and the angels uh, say the same thing, they're terrified, and he says, Fear not. Uh, for surely, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Look at his reaction. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? And what he's really saying is here, why is grace extended to me. Why is grace extended to me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the people here today. Lord, we want to, we, we, we've had good singing, a really, really good Sunday school class, and God, we just want to enjoy you. We want the reality of uh, what we have in Christ. We want the reality of grace that's, that's uh, part of the fabric of our life to be realized, to be appreciated, to be shared, 
uh, to be uh, mutually rejoiced in. So help us, God, to see just how great this grace is and, and help us, God, uh, uh, show us how to respond to, to the great grace of God. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk about the greatest illustration of grace. And I, and I realize I've preached uh, this before, and I don't know how long it's been, but I, uh, I think this is what God wants me to preach. Uh, you certainly can't mess up preaching about grace, <laughs> unmerited love. I, I want to tell you, uh, uh, I was brought up in the Methodist church, and I learned a few things there, I, but I wasn't saved. 1976, I heard a preacher on the radio got saved. I asked the lady that I work with was just the most down-to-earth, real Christian I knew. Her name was Jessie Bradford. You'll meet her in heaven. And I said, where do you go to church? She says, I go to Morning Star Baptist Church. And I said, I want to visit. So we visited, and I found out, I found out what was missing in my life. I found out what real preaching was and real fellowship, and it was, it was, it was a, um, I think the greatest thing I was taught was worship, responding to what God has done for us. And it, it, it kind of, uh, it bugs me a little bit. I know what this church can be. I know the burdens can, that can be alleviated. I know the joy that we can have. I know the faith that we can have. And we are, we're getting there. We're getting closer. And there's some things that's crystal clear in my mind that uh, I, 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 I want to have a choir. I want to have a choir. And uh, some of y'all, well, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work with me because I'm a knothead. What I would like to do is have a choir when people come in and we start right at a couple minutes before starting time and we sing these songs about a wonderful country and we sing these songs where's my here's my song this is what i would like to do i think about it almost every day <clears throat> i'd like to have a just a few people starting out singing and uh, this is a little side note but i'll get you out of here on time <laughs> i'm in love with my savior and he's in love with me he is with me from day to day. What a friend is he. Watches over me while I sleep. Hears me when I pray. I'm as happy as I can be. And I now can say, somebody loves me. I want that. <laughs> then when you get good at that, <sighs> glad reunion day. I've left the old path. I've traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Oh, Jesus the Lord, I sing a sweet song. His love lights away for me. His love lights away. I travel today. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. <sighs> Grace greater than our sin. So we're going to have a choir. We can do it the easy way. Or we can do it the hard way. Now, if you want me to be the choir director and the only person in the choir, I'm brazen enough to do that. But I would prefer we get three or four people up here that can sing. It will be imperfect, but believe me, it will lift the spirits when we come in church. Then we'll have the hymnals. I also like the song, what is it? What is that song? 10,000 Reasons, how does that go? Oh, what a song. It's a newer song. What is that song, how does it go? Somebody sing that for me. Somebody knows that. Emily, you know that. 10,000 Reasons, oh, come on now, work with me. <clears throat> I wanna have some worship 
in song, increase. <laughs> Be all right, Tom. Tom boy. <laughs> increase in worship songs and uh, kind of pay the Lord back for his grace. I want to have spontaneous testimonies like Mark gave today. That was pretty good. So, how is grace extended? The story opens in the room of King David in Jerusalem. David has in his heart to extend grace to a member of Saul's family. That is the opposite of what would normally be done. Saul would be the type of guy and he took over after David instead of before David he would have killed everybody in the family. That's just what they did. Today in politics we just slander people <laughs> instead of physically uh, taking their life. So we see how grace is extended. The reason for grace, David says he wants to show someone from the family of Saul kindness for whose sake? Jonathan. Not Saul's, Jonathan. He wants to do for Jonathan's kin, although Jonathan's dead, going on to heaven, he wants to do something for his son. You know the story of Mephibosheth, when, uh, when they were fleeing the city, he fell, he was dropped, and he, and he was lame from then on. And that's hard enough. You know what, it, you know what it, this, this is teaching us? It's what happened to us in the fall. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We fell in the Garden of Eden. And who do we need? We needed Jesus. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So grace is extended. The reason for this grace is a kindness for Jonathan's sake. And he asked Z Ziba, who is a type of the Holy Spirit, he said, is, any, is there anybody that we can show grace to based on relationship? We, we don't realize, that, I, I don't think, um, that a lot of things that we, we do and a lot of things that God did were, did were done because God loved his son Jesus. And Jesus loved his uh, father. So this thing is deeper than us. This thing is bigger than us. This thing of grace. The reason for the grace. The word kindness is also translated goodness mercy, favor, loving kindness. Grace is defined as unmerited love and favor of God toward the undeserving. You know, if, if uh, a lot of people, they're unbelievers. If they're religious and they're unbelievers, what does the Bible say of them? They're in darkness, they're blind, they're deaf, they have no spiritual touch of God. They have no spiritual connection to God. None whatsoever. And yet, we listen to people who, well, they've got an education. You don't have anything to offer unless you have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't teach me about God if you don't know God. Now, if you, if you know God and you've got an education, now that's, that's, uh, that's good. That's a help. So, God extended his grace for another, because of another. That's the nature of grace. I, I, you know, anyway, what I was saying, there's people that don't believe. Can you imagine if they're right? I know they're not, but if they were right and there's no such thing as this Bible's not true and it's all man-made and all the things that uh, people say, the concept of grace, there's nothing like it in the world. It's in no other religion. It is in no other religion. Forgiveness because of the punishment 
of someone else. Someone else leads a sinless, perfect life. We mess up over and over, and we are imputed their righteousness. What a concept. Forgiveness. Love. Unmerited love. There's nothing like it in this world. Uh, my son's involved in, in a ministry, our oldest son, and we support a man named Muhammad, which is kind of funny. Uh, when uh, we had to, he had to actually change his name to keep the ministry going, he was saved in Iran in a library, studying religions. Isn't that incredible? And so I've had folks visit, and they say, you support Muhammad? Well, it's not the same Muhammad. He's, uh, he's a man, that was his name, and he is the Apostle Paul of the Middle Easterners. He's on fire for God. And he's a witness for God. But Paul was telling me, he said, one of the things that's so interesting, when you're dealing with people that are from the Middle East that uh, were Muslims before they converted to Christianity, it's really hard for them to see grace. And he says they'll read a Bible story and they'll misinterpret it because they're looking at the wrath of God. It's all about the wrath of God. And the anger of God. So they have to be taught and, and to, to really wrap their minds around. And many, many are getting saved through the, uh, the uh, podcast that they do. There's just thousands. I think he said 50,000 a month. Was that right? That listen to that all over the Middle East and all over the world. They listen to that podcast. So... How grace is extended, kindness. What an amazing concept. What an amazing thing. And how blessed are we that we are able, uh, we're able to receive the grace of God. There's no grace anywhere. There's no mercy in any religion. There's wrath. There's... Uh, I was going to quote you from a Chinese war movie. I saw the other. Great wisdom. Great wisdom. It sounded awesome. But there's no grace. We've got grace. Grace changes you. We celebrate it. It, it, it changes. Uh, it should be a stress reliever. If church is stressful, you need to get in a different church. If church is not hopeful, I'm telling you, there's something wrong. Either you need to get saved or you need to embrace what God has offered us. We see the reach of grace. Is there any left? And again, this typifies salvation. Is there any left? Do you know what's so exciting about God and the God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is involved in a work that he doesn't have to check with us before he does it. We're not running the thing. We think we are. A lot of us preachers think we are. Both we could do this, this, and this. And the Holy Spirit said, oh, yeah, that's what it is. It's you. It's all you, bud. <laughs> no, it's the Holy Spirit. Do you know the, the, the hard-hearted people that you want to reach that you can't reach? You know, God sends them. I, I, meet, I meet so many saved people uh, in witnessing. I found a new way to witness. And it's something I've struggled with. If I don't feel physically good, and I don't feel upbeat and optimistic, I usually don't witness. I might give out a track. The other day, I was uh, over in Costco, I was getting my, I witnessed to the hearing aid person and the eyeglass person. Before long, Costco's gonna be saved. You won't have to have a card to get in, they'll trust you. But I, I was uh, in the little booth with the lady. She's checking my eyes. And I said, you know, I said, my dog got me up. Exactly what I said. My dog got me up at 4.30 in the morning. It was my shift. So I had to get up with it at 4.30. And I don't get up. I don't like getting up before 9 to 12 anyway. Because I know Brother Gay's up at, what, 3.30. So I don't need to get up that early. Because he's, he's in... He's, he's, He's taking care of everything, right? All the early morning stuff. So I sleep a little bit later. I'm usually up late. 
But I just felt so bad, and normally I'd say, I'm not going to try to witness. It's not going to come across good. So I said to the lady, I said, listen, I said, uh, I, 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 my dog had me up. I'm about half asleep. I don't feel great. I said, but I have to witness you. I've never done that before. It worked brilliantly, like most things I come up with. <laughs> and she said, that's okay. And I said, are you saved? And she said, absolutely. She told me of a tragedy she had just been through in her life. But yet she's trusting God. We have great fellowship. I went through the, I went through the, the drive through at the Sonic in Yakima. I went to grab something to eat. And that same day, and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to witness when I feel bad. You ever witnessed with a headache? I've done that one time. And the guy actually started, came to church for a year, Brother Greg. But I went through the drive through and I, and I said, hey, I said, uh, wasn't but one or two cars behind me. I said, I don't want to take up a lot of time. And did the transaction first, got my food. I said, he's wearing his mask. All I can see is his eyes. And I said, hey, I said, uh, can you tell me what is the best way to witness to someone when you're going through the drive through I said, I, it's, it's not enough time. I'm telling him all this. And I gave him a gospel track. I said, I do this. But I said, I think probably if I just looked you in the eyes, which I did, and I said, I tell you that I really care about you. I'm trying to get you to see that I really care about you, and I want you to go to heaven, and God loves you. I, you ever seen somebody's eyes smile? His eyes were smiling. And he said, God bless you. This is a new thing for me. If we are appreciative of the grace of God, we should be able to give out grace when we don't feel like it. So I just, I'm just honest with people. I'm just honest with people. And so it opened the door where I could witness. So, you know, I think about people that have received the grace of God. There's one, one, that, really, uh, one that really sticks out. And, and this is a new relationship with grace. We, we, we are under the, we are alienated from God. Separated from and deep within our heart, there's an animosity and a fear of God, a wrong kind of fear. We have a new relationship. I, I like to look at the hard cases in the Bible. The maniac of uh, Gadarena. Remember him? He, they, he, they chained him. He could, not, they, they, he could not be bound. He broke the chains. He's going around in the tombs in the graveyard. Who does that? I don't like going in graveyards at night. I used to walk by one every day when I walked to my church. You know, it wasn't so bad in the daytime, but I certainly didn't go by there at night. It's death all around. It was death within that maniac. He was demon-possessed. He's cutting himself with, with uh, pieces of pottery and, and such. And I mean, he, he's self-destructed. Jesus came. Jesus had no fear. I do not want to cast out a devil. If, if that happens, and I'm sure it does, I don't want to, I, I'm going to get Brother Mark, Brother Gay, and Brother Jay to handle that. They're expendable. I don't want to do that. Can you imagine hearing that demonic voice? Jesus knew who they were, and he cast them out. And now this man who had no clothes on, who was self-destructive, he comes and, and he comes to the feet of Jesus and he said, I got to stay with you. He said, no, 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 I got a mission for you. You take this grace and you go and you show it to your friends and family. I remember when I did that. Boy, was that bizarre. I mean, we were kind of rough, kind of wicked. And uh, for me to come in, the worst, I, I, I'm ashamed to tell you, if I told you things I did, you'd say, man, you are a wicked man. And I was. But I went to my family. It was humbling. It was embarrassing. But I went because of the grace of God. I said, you know, God forgave me. And we, over, over time, we saw uh, some say, the reach of grace. 
Grace has a, a long reach. What about Kathy's uncle we prayed for here? How many years? 40 years? From the time we got saved, we started praying for her uncle and aunt. And then we got a report. I think she ran into them, which is down there visiting her dad. And they wanted nothing to do with church. You know what? They had joined a Baptist church. They were involved in the ministry. I'm thinking 40 years it took for that particular couple to come to Christ. We share grace. And Mephibosheth, he lived in a place called Makar, uh, a house, and then a place called Lodabar. It means, uh, it was, uh, Makar means sold. Lodabar means no pasture or no bread. You got no pasture. Nothing grows here. That's where we were. We weren't in a palace. We weren't eating high on the hall. We, weren't, uh, we, we were worried about making it from day to day spiritually. What in the world's going to happen? Hoping something bad's not going to happen and having no power over it if it does. But God who is rich in mercy. He came to that place for every one of you that know Christ as your Savior. And he lifted you up and he had you put in a chariot, in a king's chariot, and brought to the king's house. We are living in the king's house now. You know, God's greater than your past. I don't meet people very often that, that I, I knew. I did actually meet two guys I went to high school with that... Uh, were truck drivers and I ran into them. See, it was Dan Fleming, I forget the other guy's name, but they played football at the high school I went to and they were, um, they came in a restaurant where I was. And I looked, I said, I know you. He said, yeah, you do, John Allen. <laughs> he said, I heard you were out here preaching somewhere, but I didn't know, I hadn't saw him in years. I hadn't saw him since I got saved. And it used to be I'd go back, we'd go back to North Carolina and run into somebody that knew me. We've all had this happen. That knew me before I came to Christ. And I was pretty rough. And they would say, what are you up to? Said, Jesus. That says it all. Jesus. I'm a, I'm a gospel preacher. I'm living the life. I'm, I'm getting as much grace in my heart as I can. I'm giving out as much as I can. Oh, the reach of grace. You know, your past, I remember Dr. Seitler, who was over the Bible college and had a church of 3,000 people. And pretty famous in the South. I've actually got some of, found some of his books out here. And he preached on the radio out here after he's dead. He's still on the radio for years. But I remember him talking about the grace of God. He said, you know, nobody knew it for years. The lady had finally passed away. But he said, I had a lady uh, in our church singing in our choir. She was a prostitute before she came to Christ. And uh, on the streets of Greenville, South Carolina, she's a prostitute for years. And nobody ever knew. And uh, there was a street preacher that preached and she got saved. And he said she's been in the choir for years and years and years. And you know what? She was a new creature in Christ Jesus. Not the same anymore. Not the same person. And if you were to make an indictment against her and you go to Christ and you said, hey, 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 this woman, you, she's a sinner. He'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. All of her sins, they're as far as the east is from the west. You need to tell people that. Somebody brings up your past, say, what are you talking about? Show them in the Bible. Every sin. Well, I'm glad it's not just some sin. Every sin you've ever committed when you give your heart to Christ is under that blood. 
grace. I want to celebrate grace. I don't know how many more years I've got. Probably 50. <laughs> who's, who's laughing? <laughs> I'm going to enjoy grace. And you're going to enjoy it with me whether you like it or not. We're going to have a time. Yeah. We're going to celebrate what God has done for us. Came from a place of of no bread, no pasture. He's injured in a, in a fall. He was dropped. He's crippled. He's un, unable to get to the king. He's separated. He's in hiding. He's afraid. You know that his name, Mephibosheth, means shameful? You got any things you're ashamed of? Well, I do. I'm ashamed I waited so long to come to Christ. I was 26 when I got saved had no idea what I was in for. I remember coming to that church and that preacher, he brought the wood. And he preached the word. I mean, you would, you, you'd want to leave if he was preaching today, you'd be too afraid to. I saw him preach one time in the pulpit and his teeth came out. Whole set of beautiful false teeth. And they popped out of his mouth and he with one hand snatched them up Put them back in and never missed a beat. I asked my wife, did I see that or did I dream that? It was so quick. I'm enjoying this journey because of grace. We need to get into grace. I'll take all you got. I want all the grace you got. I want it in every area of my life. I want to be forgiven. I want to feel forgiven. I want to show forgiven. <laughs> you know God extends grace to whosoever will. There's nobody you can't witness to. There's nobody in this world you say, you know, they're different than me. I can't witness to them. Or they're religious, or they're not religious, or they're older or younger, and they're from a different uh, millennials. What a bizarre group of people. My son, Joel, always picks on me, so I just, I said, well, what generation is the millennial? I said, thank you. So I give him, I just make up things. What's the next group after millennial? We're the baby boomers. I guess it'll be the uh, COVID-19 babies. There's going to be a lot of them, undoubtedly. We have any COVID-19? How's that baby? That's about right, right there. <laughs> Is that a girl or a boy? Girl. Hallelujah. How old is she? Seven months. Seven months. Hallelujah. How grace is embraced. Imagine this now. He, he's taken from the slums. From he, he's out begging for bread. Doesn't know. And he's fearing for his life because of the custom of a new king wiping out that family. Not only did he not get wiped out, he got set at the king's table. And the king said, you're going to eat bread continually from my table. I've been mean, eating bread from his table for 40 years. It's pretty good. It's manna. It's pretty good. I love meeting new people that, that are saved. And I've met some people and God's done some amazing things to see the grace of God in their life. And I tell them about the grace of God in my life. From sinking sand, he lifted me. I like getting a hug every now and then. My wife doesn't like to hug. I have to take her arms She's sitting right there. And physically put her arms around me. That's how unwanted I am. I have to actually take her arms and put, once you get them there, she's okay with it. She just doesn't know how to do it. Doesn't want it to lead to anything. So, uh, <coughs> How grace is expanded. 
Grace provides a future. I got a new relate. I got a new father. I got a new heavenly father. And he loves me. He tells me he loves me. Not he just told me. He's still telling me. I kind of like him. I like what he's doing in my life. I like that he trusts me to do his will. He can count on me. It's a good feeling when God can count on you. And he says, hey, will you do this for me? I say, Absolutely. Brother uh, Despain uh, texted me that they said I, yesterday. He said, I want you to preach. I don't know, two or three times. He said, I want you to preach on witnessing for the kingdom of God. I'm thinking, we are in trouble if I'm the guy that they're bringing in to witness, to teach about witnessing. I, I do talk a lot about witnessing, but I never intended to be the guy. I just wanted, I just saw a need and I wanted to say, hey, listen, we got to be a witness. And I said, hey, come in and tell us how to witness. And I'm thinking, I don't know how. I'll tell you what I know. I'll try to motivate you. We're witnessing for God, not just to build a church. Most of my witnessing doesn't build this church, but it encourages Christians and it gets people into the house of God. How many people have you witnessed to? I've witnessed to people in this town that they didn't get saved when I talked to them, but all I know is one, one time they were unsaved and the next time I saw them, they were saved. And I'm thinking, Maybe I helped a little bit with that. Maybe I was a part of that. I hope so. I just want to preach grace. I want to enjoy the power of grace. Kind of hard to, <laughs> hard to get mad at God and say, I don't want your grace. I don't want your love. I don't want your forgiveness. You're not as big as God is. Your sin's not so big that God can't wipe it out. Your problem's not so deep that God can't change it. You stay in the house of God and the Word of God will change you. It will. God will change you. You think, boy, that never happened. Oh, yes, it will. Some things might take years. He'll change you. He'll get some of that junk out because you can't have that in there and grace come in. I love grace. I love unmerited love. I love that Jesus is excited about the work of the church. He's excited about our worship. Oh, we need to worship. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We have a new relationship. We have a new reality. It's a different atmosphere. It's different on the inside. It's different on the outside. Is there anything more important? People, they're traveling all over the solar system and beyond to find out what's on those planets. I don't care. If you say they might find life, I don't care. That somebody said there was one asteroid they thought maybe it had gold and nickel and silver in it. If that one falls here, we'll get to it first. We'll buy that church land. But I really don't care. I, I, I realize something about myself. I don't care about stuff. I don't care about money. I'm happy. Are we happy, baby? We don't need stuff to be happy. Some of y'all, and we went for years thinking we needed stuff to be happy. We got to get the new stuff. Got to get my kids overloaded with stuff. Don't overload that baby. Look at her. That's a doll. What's her name? Lavia. Say that real slow. Lavia. Beautiful. Train that child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They don't need stuff. 
I, I, oh yeah, I got uh, Mrs. Despain is going to come up. Brother Despain is going to come up sometime and preach. She's going to do a ladies' meeting. They do such a wonderful job. They have one baby of their own. They adopted two, I think it is, and she does such a great job. And I was over at their house when we were there, and, and the girls were vacuuming and cleaning. I said, how much money you get for that? She said, you know, we get, how, how old are those kids? Ten? Six. No, not the two bigger ones. Oh. Maybe you're right. But anyway, she said, we get room and board. We get food. I thought, boy, she's been brainwashed. I said, you know, I want to stir something up. I said, they should be paying you $5 a week for this. What they're doing is illegal. And they looked at me, those wheels were turning. If I see them again, I'm going to start again. You should be getting paid. Boy, they do a great job with those kids. I'm thinking, I want you to teach. You know, I, I worry about it. I, I, I said, I want you to come over and teach our ladies about how to raise our kids for God, how to raise spiritual children. And we, we tried to do that. I, I told somebody the other day, I think it was Upper County, we were great parents when it came to getting them to church and getting them to Jesus and being constantly vocal in their life about right and wrong. But as far as getting the bed at 6 o'clock, what time's our daughter-in-law getting her kids to bed? 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Who does it? Ours went to bed at 3 o'clock in the evening. We didn't do a great job. Hey, listen, our kids were the rowdiest ones in church. They wanted to play. They wanted to box. They were excited. And we'd go over to a friend's house. I mean, we'd stay at 12, 1 o'clock. We got ready to go. We'd find the kids. They was asleep. One in a chair, one on the floor. And in the summer, they'd go outside and play. And when it got, come time to go to bed, we'd go find their little bodies. Pick them up, throw them over our shoulder, put them in the bed. And they are the most disciplined people I for the life of me, don't know where they got that. They did not get it from us. That's grace. It's grace. And it just keeps on giving and keeps on going. And you need to get all you can because that junk in this world, the sin of this world, will not satisfy you. You ever get a good bowl of grace? How many love grits? Oh my God! You get a bowl of grits with, I mean, about a fourth of a, fourth of a, a, a thing of butter on it, and a touch of bacon grease, just a touch. Oh, you can't stop eating it. It's like pickled pig's feet. You just can't stop. I want grace. I want to see grace on your face. I want you to enjoy grace. I want to hear how good God is in your life.